Hello, welcome back to another Film in My Out and About series. And today I'd like to talk to you about the Isle of Thanet. Now, in case you're unsure where Thanet actually is, this is a map of the southeast of England. And uh, Thanet is actually on the very tip of Kent. So not that far from London, uh, but you'll see also not that far from the continent. And the reason that it's called the Isle of Thanet is that um, back in the day it, it was actually um, removed from the mainland of Kent. There was a channel called the Wonsum Channel that separated it from the mainland. And that channel actually gave access from the sea to the city of Canterbury, the capital of Kent. Um, and the River Stour, which flows through Canterbury, was actually navigable all the way up to the city. Um, so Thanet actually was in a very strategic position guarding the approaches to the city of Canterbury. But nowadays, um, the island is joined to the mainland. Um, the rivers Wonson and Stour still exist, but the Wonson is so tiny you could more or less step over it in places. Um, and Stour flows through an area that um, silted up a long time ago, so it meanders its way out to the sea um, at Pegwall Bay. Now there are three principal coastal towns in Thanet, all of which are very popular as um, holiday attractions. The first of them is Margate, uh, which is on the north coast of the island. Margate itself is um, a little bit run down nowadays, but it's still got very um, wide expanses of sand on the beaches. Um, and is very popular as a day trip resort. Um, it's been perked up a little bit recently by the arrival of the Turner Contemporary Gallery and it's becoming a little bit of a trendy spot to visit. And then around the coast you have Broadstairs which is a much more genteel town, um, very attractive, uh, linked to Charles Dickens who lived there for quite a while. Again, it's got some very nice beaches. Uh, Viking Bay in particular is very attractive. And um, again, it's popular both as a holiday resort and a day trip resort. And then around the coast on the south side of Thanet, you have Ramsgate, which is my favorite. Um, I lived here for about four years. Ramsgate has a really nice harbor um, which nowadays is only used by leisure vessels and so on. Um, but at one time, when I was living there in the 80s, there was a ferry service that ran across from here to Dunkirk. Ramsgate always feels to me as though it's much more of a bustling kind of port than Margate, but um, as we'll see, Margate is actually the administrative centre of Thanet and has the district council offices there. And then inland you have a smallish place called St Peter's which is more or less equidistant between those three coastal towns. Um, tiny place, really busy road that runs through it, it's really difficult to get across in all the traffic but nice attractive place. There are a number of other smaller places in Thanet as well, such as Birchington and Minster, but uh, these are the four places that I'll concentrate on. Wherever you go in Thanet, you're not far from the coastline and these type of cliffs. And inland, um, all the little towns and villages are interspersed with agriculture. There are fields wherever you go. So it's got this really nice atmosphere of uh, coastal sea breezes and fresh air and so on. Um, really nice place, isn't it?
But the other thing I like about it is it's just chock full of history. Um, that's going to be the main theme of this film, is discussing the history of Thanet with you. So, where to begin? Well, um, this year, 2015, saw a general election and uh, Nigel Farage, the leader of UKIP, the United Kingdom Independence Party, chose to stand as a parliamentary candidate in Thanet South. Now, he failed to win, and win the seat, but um, at the same time, there was a local council election and Thanet District Council is now the first council in the country um, with a UKIP majority. And at the same time, um, just recently, Thanet has been in the news again uh, because of the um, immigrant crisis at the Channel Tunnel and the Operation Stack um, where freight lorries are being um, kept are being kept waiting on the um, motorways leading down to Dover and it's been decided to um, park a lot of these lorries um, in Manston Airport which is on Thanet uh, much to the disgust of the local inhabitants who claim that the roads are going to become choked and this won't be good for the tourist industry. Um, I'm not sure they've got a very good argument because Ramsgate at one stage had a very busy uh, freight container um, terminal and it was quite common to see lorries thundering down the roads to that so I think the road system can probably cope with it. But anyway, um, Thanet's been in the headlines quite a bit this year um, because of uh, the uh, elections and so on. And it's quite common to see um, press photographers and so on down there interviewing the inhabitants about their uh, opinions. And this is quite ironic, really, because ever since the land bridge to Europe disappeared and the English Channel was formed, the inhabitants of Thanet have been very aware of the advantages and disadvantages of being so close to Europe. On a clear day, it's quite possible to see the French coastline um, from the cliff tops, uh, especially from Ramsgate, as the name of this guest house makes clear. And when I was down there last taking these uh, films um, I wasn't really able to get a very good view because the weather was quite hazy but there was one evening where um, it had rained and the air was quite clear and uh, you can see a sort of glimpse of the French coastline on this footage. We tend to think of the English Channel as a defensive moat around England, but in fact, it's just as much a bridge to the continent. Yes, it was instrumental in preventing Napoleon and Hitler from invading, but at the same time, um, it allowed the Normans to invade. And uh, in the time before the Romans in the Iron Age, um, there were a lot of links between France and this part of the world. So much so that this probably prompted Julius Caesar to um, scout out England um, in order to prevent the Belgic tribes from helping one another across the Channel while he was trying to subdue Gaul. And then in AD 43, it was Richborough on the um, south side of the Wonsum Channel that saw the uh, first Roman legionaries set foot on British soil prior to their conquest of the entire island. These are some shots of the Roman fort at Richborough, um, mainly of the later Saxon shore fort, but Richborough was actually the main gateway into Roman Britain for a couple of centuries. 
and the Romans placed another fort at Reculva at the other end of the Wonsum Channel. Um, you can see Reculva Towers, which are an Anglo-Saxon medieval church uh, from Margate. If I can focus in, there we go, there they are. So really, since Roman times, Thanet has been um, a key link between Britain and Europe, and it seems quite appropriate that Nigel Farage chose to contest a parliamentary seat there. The Roman armies were withdrawn from Britain in 410, and it was only a few decades later in 449 that uh, King Vortigern of Kent invited um, two Anglo-Saxon leaders called Hengist and Horsa um, to act as mercenaries for him and he gave them Thanet to settle on and of course from that springboard um, the whole Anglo-Saxon colonization of Britain began and the white horse symbol of Kent is supposed to be um, a reflection of Horsa's emblem. So once again, Thanet acted as a springboard for invasion of the island. There's one part of Thanet that to me encapsulates the history of uh, Britain's relations with the continent, and that's Pegwell Bay. Um, which is on the south side of Thanet, you can see it here. It's a very wide, shallow bay at low tide. Um, the sea virtually disappears off to the horizon and it's just flat sand. Um, but at this spot, the white cliffs um, come to an end briefly at a village appropriately named Cliff's End. Um, this bay has seen a great many historic events as well as a great deal of traffic with the continent. Um, for instance, this is the village of Pegwell at the north side of the bay, um, a famous smuggling resort back in the 18th and early 19th century. And there are two neighbouring pubs in the village of Pegwell which are um, supposed to be riddled with tunnels underneath them which communicate with the houses on the opposite side of the road so it's a perfect smuggler's den. The pub at the end there was once called the Moonlighters it's changed its name in the recent past though. The view from the Bellevue as its name suggests is really spectacular it's probably my favourite pub in the whole of England um, I'll just let the camera pan around here. There you can see the Stour filling out into the bay. Uh, we're going back that way in a moment, so you'll get another glimpse of it. There, that sort of snaking waterway coming in, that leads all the way to Canterbury. And about that spot there was where St Augustine landed, bringing Christianity back to England. Um, the skyline there used to be dominated by the uh, Richborough Power Station towers. These are a couple of photographs I took oh, about 10 years ago now, um, before the towers were demolished. Um, but they had a they had a certain appeal to them. Not everyone, not to everyone's taste, I know. And a short walk inland from Cliff's End is a spot um, where in the 19th century this commemorative cross was placed. It's supposed to be the location of where St Augustine preached to King Ethelbert, um, eventually leading to his conversion to Christianity. So you can't really get a more powerful symbol of European influence on Britain with a 
Roman Catholic faith being introduced into Britain in Pegmore Bay at this at this very spot, this place called Ebbsfleet. It's in quite an isolated place, but it's still a spot that obviously um, has a great deal of religious attachment to it. Um, the last time I went there was a long time ago, but there was something like this left on the plinth then. Um, I think it's a Roman Catholic prayer. So it uh, refers to our separated brethren, whoever they may be. Back on the coastline of Pegwell Bay, just beside the old Sandwich Road, there's this rather splendid uh, Viking ship um, named the Hugin. And the Hugin is or was a fully functioning sailing vessel. It was brought across from Denmark in 1949, landed at Viking Bay in Broadstairs. Um, the bay was named Viking Bay after this ship arrived, not before. Um, and it was brought across to commemorate uh, the 1500th anniversary um, of Hengist and Horses um, occupation of Thanet. Now it's in a very appropriate place because I'm sure Pegwell Bay saw a great many Viking ships land and there's even actually an area that's just beside Margate called Dane Valley which um, implies that uh, the, the Vikings actually landed there. But the ship is actually commemorating an Anglo-Saxon settlement of Thanet. So why, why have Danes instead of Germans? Well, I would suggest this is because um, we're only four years after the end of the Second World War, and clearly there was still a great deal of animosity towards the Germans. During the Second World War, Thanet was obviously very close to German-occupied France. And um, I'll just show you this map of Thanet again with the arrow pointing at Pegwell Bay. If you look inland, that um, long grey line to the north of Hengist Way is actually Manston Airfield. So it's right behind Pegwell Bay. Manston played a critical role in the Battle of Britain and was in an important airfield uh, for a number of other operations. During the Battle of Britain it took an absolute pasting because um, German planes and realised that they could approach England um, from the Thames estuary, the mouth of the estuary where our radar defences were sparse and then turn south, fly over Thanet and um, zap the airfield before the uh, British knew they were coming. But also of course you have this beach which is nice inviting beach for an invasion and right behind it there's an airfield which if the Germans had captured it would have made a perfect landing zone for reinforcements. So Pegwell Bay during World War II was very heavily defended. Um, now, right in the centre of the shop there, you may or may not be able to make out a, a garage on the Sandwich Road. And that garage was built there in 1983 and replaced um, a battery observation post. But beneath the garage, um, are some silos uh, where petrol was kept um, so it's an ideal place to obviously put a garage but the petrol actually was a reservoir for a defense called a fugas and this is an aerial shot taken in 1946 um, you can see a rectangular shape in the center that's the 
uh, battery observation post where the garage now stands. And leading out into the sea, you can see two parallel uh, dark lines and a long line running roughly parallel with the coast. Um, the two parallel lines going out are the feeder pipes which fed petrol from the reservoir out to a scaffolding barrier which is the long line running parallel with the coast and the idea was that um, the Germans would get uh, they would have to they would have to land at high tide obviously when the water was up otherwise they'd have to trudge through about a mile of um, wet sand um, and then their craft would get encumbered on the scaffolding barrier uh, which would then be ignited um, by this petrol system, um, thus foiling their plans. Early in 1942, um, a squadron of swordfish biplane torpedo planes took off from Manston Airport in an attempt to intercept two German battleships, the Scharnhorst and the Gneisenau, um, as they made a dash through the channel um, from Brest into the North Sea. Um, and they didn't really have sufficient fighter escort and um, were overwhelmed by the German fighter escort and all the uh, planes were shot down and I think only about five of the crew survived. The, the leader of the attack was awarded a posthumous VC um, and the great tragedy of it was that um, a lot of the <coughs> pilots and uh, observers who took part in the, the raid had participated in the sinking of the Bismarck a few months earlier. Wherever you go in Thanet, you come across reminders of the Second World War. Um, this is an old railway tunnel entrance, but it leads into a system of caves underneath Ramsgate that were used. Uh, this is an old uh, mine that's now used as a charity box. Um, these are some bricked up apertures in the cliff face, which were obviously gun emplacements or something like that during the war. Um, this is an old semaphore and defensive position um, which is around the coast at North Foreland which is not far from Broadstairs. So I think it's fair to say that the uh, residents of Thanet uh, were on average slightly more Europhobic than um, the rest of the British population and it makes it a natural um, breeding ground really for UKIP and it's not surprising that um, that they've taken over the council. At the same time there is a sense of good humour about it. Um, I thought I'd show you some posters on the wall of a pub. Um, Shepherd Neem are the local brewery, they're based in Faversham in Kent and they have a, a beer called Spitfire which is obviously a reference to the Spitfire aircraft of World War II and these uh, are very humorous I find them hilarious these posters uh, they've all got a World War II um, theme ribbing the Germans um, beware of in enemy infiltration there's a, a photograph of a German lager trying to take over from Spitfire they all refer to Spitfire as the Bottle of Britain, which again is a pun on the Battle of Britain. Uh, this one, Sea Kale, is a pun on the German Sea Kyle, with all the bar pumps um, pretending to give a Nazi salute. I think Nigel Farage missed the trick not being photographed in this pub. He's often seen in pubs with a pint of beer in his hands. It would have been a good uh, advertisement for Shepherd Neem as well. This one is two more pints, please, with Churchill giving his famous V sign. Uh, 
I don't think these posters actually ever made it to an advertising campaign. They were probably just decided it was the slightly bad taste. I find them funny. Uh, no Fokker comes close. Um, obvious what that pun refers to. And this is my personal favourite, downed all over Kent, just like the Luftwaffe. In the 1970s, Pegwell Bay saw another European enterprise when a company called Hoverloid um, established a hover port on the uh, coastline at Pegwell Bay. Uh, this is a photograph I took of one of the hovercraft uh, way back in the early 80s, late 1970s. It didn't occur to me, of course, at the time that I took this photograph that I was capturing a little piece of history. Um, unfortunately, the hovercraft crossings of the channel ceased some time ago. The hovercraft itself was a great piece of British invention and design produced in the 1960s. And um, this particular hovercraft was massive. It could house um, cars and passengers and cross the channel in about 40 minutes compared to getting on for an hour and a half or so for the ferries that crossed. But unfortunately, um, there were a number of factors that mitigated against it. Um, petrol prices rose, made it slightly more expensive and it was always prone to disruption in bad weather. Um, I can remember talking to uh, an ex-stewardess on Hoverloid who spoke about one particular time when rough waves broke the front window panels of the craft, scattering um, glass all over some of the seats at the front. Luckily, no one was injured. Eventually, Hoverloid merged with a rival service that ran out of Dover called Sea Speed, which was owned by National Rail, British Rail. Um, and the port at Pegwell Bay was eventually just used for servicing the craft and then closed eventually. Now all the buildings have been demolished and it's um, just basically asphalt and few girders and things remaining. Um, it's been given back to nature and makes quite a good wildlife sanctuary for butterflies and birds and so on. So the hover porters joined the remnants of other historical sites around Pegwell Bay um, and you can just gaze on it and reflect on Britain's relationship with Europe. Around the coast at Ramsgate, um, you can see where the terminal building for the Sally Line ferry service from Ramsgate to Dunkirk used to be. The Sally Line used to run a passenger ferry and a freight service across to the continent, um, but eventually um, they ran out of business. Uh, Channel Tunnel was really the final nail in the co coffin for them, but um, there was a very unhappy, tragic incident where um, a gantry similar to this one collapsed, killing a number of passengers while they were trying to board the ferry. Um, so that was close to the demise of the Sally Line as well. The ferry service 
um, was a great boost to the local economy though and the Thanet uh, District Council now run by UKIP are talking about reintroducing a service from Ramsgate whether they managed to get their plans off the ground or not I don't know but um, it would be very useful to the town if there were a ferry service running again. As I said earlier um, Ramsgate is a much more bustling kind of harbour than Margate even now um, but there are lots of reminders on the seafront uh, for instance this building on the right here is the old custom house so plenty of reminders of how thriving a port Ramsgate once was um, there's a very prominent obelisk that was erected to commemorate um, the landing of uh, George the fourth in the 1820s when he was returning from Hanover um, and he designated the harbour at Ramsgate a royal harbour after that so it was quite a prestigious and thriving port at one time further down the coast at a place called Dumpton Gap you have this uh, very unprepossessing station which marks the site of where a telegraph cable ran um, across to France and it's actually quite a historic site in its own right. Um, the first underwater cable ran from Dover across to I believe Calais and had been designed by a chap called Crampton who was born in Broadstairs and this particular cable um, was laid soon after based on the same design. As you go further along the coast even a tiny place like Broadstairs has some reminders of our links to the continent. On the uh, beach at Viking Bay there's a house that was once known as Admiral House um, and was renamed Eagle House uh, back in 1815. Admiral House had been the headquarters of the coast blockade during the Napoleonic Wars and then on the 21st of June 1815 a major Percy landed here with a captured French standard from the Battle of Waterloo and uh, ever since then it's been known as Eagle House. This particular eagle is um, obviously a modern replica. It was placed there in 2010 and there are plenty of other reminders of the Napoleonic Wars in Thanet, um, particularly in Ramsgate which was uh, largely built around the Regency period. La Belle Alliance was obviously the house where Wellington and Blucher met after the Battle of Waterloo. I love the name of this road, the Plains of Waterloo. It's a great name for a road. And on either side of the harbour in Ramsgate, um, on the cliffs, there are two impressive terraced crescents. One is named after Nelson and the other after Wellington. And around the coast at Kingsgate you've got the remains of this fortification which to me looks as though it comes from the Napoleonic era. It's not exactly a Martello fort but it's very similar to that. Further around the coast at North Foreland we return to the theme of Britain's relations with Germany. This house is called Maldera um, at one time it was a very grand house built for Lord Curzon who was next Viceroy of India and uh, he was the father-in-law of Sir Oswald Mosley the notorious 
leader of the British Union of Fascists before the Second World War. And at one time, there was a chap living here who was also a member of the British Union of Fascists, was called Arthur Tester. Now, Arthur Tester was the manager of a company called the European Press Agency, um, which received covert funding from the German government before the war. And um, he was almost certainly involved in um, espionage as well, um, particularly as uh, this house is situated so close to Manston Airport. In 1938, questions were asked in the House of Commons about Arthur Tester's activities, and he fled the country, went to Germany, and subsequently joined the German army. Possibly he may even have joined the SS, and he was a employed as an army interrogator in Romania and he was killed towards the end of the war and his remains were identified by his dental records from his time in Thanet. The British Union of Fascists also had an office in Broadstairs High Street and unfortunately, this um, swastika on the side of a building in Broadstairs has been identified as relating to that office. But in fact, the building was built in 1901, long before the swastika had fascist connotations. And it's simply um, an accidental, you might say, design in the brickwork. Um, the swastika had no fascist um, links at the time that this building was constructed. But this didn't prevent a candidate in the recent general election from suggesting that Broadstairs had strong fascist sympathies and that um, Nigel Farage's party, UKIP, had fascist sympathies themselves. It's just a sad matter of fact nowadays that the anti-European <coughs> lobby um, is dominated by right-wing sympathisers. Um, at one stage there were some very left-wing politicians such as Michael Foote and Tony Benn who were opposed to our union with Europe as well but unfortunately modern day europhobic sentiment is entirely right-wing um, and this has tend to colour the whole European debate which is ironic, really, as the present EEC has been compared to the Fourth Reich because it's so um, dominated by Germany. And how's this for one final irony? This very modest house in St. Peter's was the birthplace of Edward Heath, the Prime Minister who had very strong Europhile sentiments and was the Prime Minister who took Britain into Europe in 1972. He grew up in Thanet and went to Chatham House Grammar School in Ramsgate, where he learned to speak French very badly. And you can't help but wonder if the UKIP controlled local council now have plans to do something with this blue plaque on the wall of his birthplace. So that's the end of this part of the film where I've tried to summarise Thanet's role in the relationship between Britain and the continent and um, 
in the next film I intend to explore Thanet's history as a holiday resort and the famous people who have visited Thanet or lived there. So see you on the next film.